Take your Bibles and go with me to Luke chapter 15. As we've been in this series, Prodigal God, looking into the story that Jesus tells. But I think you have to understand that a story is just, it's just a story if you don't know the context of what's driving it. Because every story has a purpose and every story can have power to it if you understand the context. How many of you have ever read one of the, uh, the princess stories from Walt Disney? You've read those to your kids, your grandkids, and they always start with a famous line. What's the famous line? Once upon a time. And there's something about the context of that phrase that says, okay, it's not this time. It's once upon a time. And it may not even be in like an area of life that you would know or like a normal town. It's this different town. And so you, you kind of understand that it's that. Now, that, that's kind of the, the lady version. So maybe the guy version uh, would be this. So we'll think of movies. Movies are stories. Maybe... Can you identify this movie? <laughs> no one's identified it yet. You just all laughed. Star Wars, okay. Just all laughing at something. I don't know. Star Wars, one of the greatest movies of all time. Okay, well, I don't know about that. But um, a lot of fun in this movie. And we, we see that line, we're like, oh, that's Star Wars. That's, it gave you a context. So you began to understand where the movie and the story begins to flow from there. It puts you in the frame of mind where you understand. And what you have to understand about Jesus is too often sometimes we can make him a storyteller, just a guy that tells a story. You have to understand that he, he lives his life. And in the context of living life, he may tell a story that has a purpose and has power and a point behind it. And you have to understand. And so the writer of the Gospel of Luke, Luke, is recording this so the early church would know, and he writes some things in Luke chapter 15. Let's start with verse 1. Here's what he says. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear him. Who's he speaking of? Jesus Okay, they're gathering around to hear him. Remember, we talked earlier that tax collectors were even seen as less than sinners, less than those people who would just kind of do their own thing and didn't want anything to do with God. So they even had a lower category. And here we see that category. The tax collector sinners were all gathering around to hear him. And then verse 2. But the Pharisees, the religious leaders of the day, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Anyone ever have your mom stop you from muttering? I had a muttering problem when I was growing up, and my mom would always say, just enunciate, talk. I'm like, okay, don't mutter. And mutter is not just this critique. See, to understand the context of the stories, three of them in particular, that Luke is going to lay out here, you have to really understand this word, the context of it. So I'm going to teach you a Greek word. Ready? The Greek word for mutter is diakonizo. Diakonizo. And it's not just this grumble or critique. How many of you have been watching March Madness? I bet somewhere along the line you had a mutter, a grumble against a referee and a call that they made, right? It was a simple critique. Oh, bad call! That was your critique in that moment. And, and then it, it faded away. But sometimes when diakonizo begins to take root, it doesn't just fade away. It's not just a simple critique, true story, uh, my own uh, pride, confession. I play soccer on Friday nights. May not look like it, but I do. <laughs> I run around. There was a particular referee, and I don't think Steve's here, because it's not you, Steve. Um, it was a particular referee uh, that is refereeing one of our games, and he, he made a bad call against our team, eh, two or three throughout the game, and it began to bug me. And I'm over on the sideline, and someone else is in playing, and then I realized this has gone from a simple critique to diaconies in my own heart, because the next week, I showed up for the next game, and he was there. And I hadn't even been on the field yet, and he hadn't blown his whistle yet to anybody, and yet Diakonizo was in my own heart. 
And I began to say, ooh, okay, God, I, I got to bring that before you. That, I don't even know his name. In Diaconizo, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them and begins to grind at these Pharisees. And then Jesus tells some stories. So now you have the context of what the story begins to unfold. He tells the story of this lost sheep. And there's something that's lost, and there's this search that goes on, and it's found, and then there's this celebration and this invitation to join in. Then there's this lost coin, and something's lost, and then there's this search, and it's found, and there's this celebration and this invitation to join in. And then we come to the story that we've been looking at. This man who has two sons. And Jesus begins to lay out, I think real simply, this pattern. There's some lost in this. In this particular story, there's not really a search. But then there's some foundness. And there's some celebration and this invitation to learn. As Glenn kind of unpacked the very first week, we kind of looked at these two sons. And they have two different paradigms, two different mindsets, two different approaches to life. And one of them just says, you know, I just, I just want the Father's things. I just, I want, I want the blessing. So just give that to me so I can go. And so he packs up the GTO, takes off to Nevada, and this is Vegas boy, right? And he just takes off running. He, he can't live up to either the expectations or somehow the things that are in his mind. He just doesn't want to. He just wants to run and to run away. And so he puts on his running shoes and he takes off. That's his reference, that's his mindset, that's how he views, and so he goes, and life is good for a while until things begin to cave around him. He runs out of money, his friends, friends suddenly fade away. He doesn't have anything left, and, and he's left with nothing, and doing something that a Jewish boy, wow, they just would not do. He's feeding slop to pigs, and that's the job he's hired himself out for. And there's this story that begins to go in his life. But there's the second son. There's this elder son that, in a lot of ways, is just he's trying to earn the father's things. He's just work, work, work. I've got to earn these things. And if I work hard enough, and if I stay close enough, and if I do the right things, then surely I'll have access to the father's things. And so he just puts on his work boots every day. And he goes out, and he works and he works, and he works. But in the end, he just wants the Father's things. And yeah, he hasn't left the premises, but the proximity of his heart is just as far away as his brother, the runner. So these two different approaches, two different paradigms, and Jesus is telling this story in the context of saying, look, look, Diakonizo, is taking root in your heart. And I've come to show a different paradigm, a different mindset, a different choice, and it's this choice of the Father. This heart of compassion that comes before you and says, look, it's not about just running away. Not just about trying to escape. It's not just about earning, because both of those lead to lostness. And I've come that you may be found and welcomed home. I'm offering a different way. Friends, that is the gospel, that is the story of Jesus, that is the context of what's going on in a grander scale outside of the story, and yet one son just wants to earn. I'm going to do the right thing so that God has to bless me. He has to. He owes it to me. So I'm going to work. I'm going to put on the work boots, and yet the proximity of his heart is he just wanted the Father's things. And he didn't want the father any more than the other son. Maybe that's why Jesus, earlier in the gospel, says, you know what Isaiah wrote about you? When he prophesied about you hypocrites, it's written, these people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. It's just not even close. And Jesus begins to go and tell the story of this father who views both his sons still as sons. And there's this beautiful look that Glenn looked at last week, this idea of our sonship and our identity as a follower of Jesus. 
that we can live in that. That's why John writes 1 John 3, 1. He says, how great is the love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God, and that's what we are. We have a new identity when we trust our life to Jesus. And so as we look into the story, I want us to look into a different maybe aspect to see the heart of the Father, that very clearly as Jesus is living his life, he's ruffled the feathers of some of these folks who are wearing work boots, and they're just trying to earn the Father's things. And in the context of that, he tells some stories. And he's driving home a point, and part of his point is his mission. He has a mission, very clearly stated in these stories. Something is lost, and I'm here to find it. And to welcome back in celebration those who are found. That's his point, his mission. I have came to seek and save the what? The lost. And he tells the story of this father. This father who's moved with great heart of compassion. That he's helping people see who God is. In maybe a new way. Because Jesus is not just telling a story, he's living life for people to see. He's modeling the way for it to be. There's a Sunday school teacher that at the start of the fall would have his kindergarten, first grade class, and, and he's there, and he would give them a blank piece of paper, and he would say to the, to the young boys and girls, he'd say, look, I want you to draw a picture of God, which seems really abstract to me. I don't know how I would even go about doing that. And they, he said, I just want you to draw a picture of God. And so they would draw for a while, and then he would give them another blank piece of paper, and he'd say, I want you to draw a picture of Jesus. And so they would draw for a while. And then he gathered these up and he took them home and he began to look at them and he began to notice some similarities. He said both had a warm face and a long flowing hair and a long beard. Both had a long flowing robe with a purple or blue sash. The difference was that Jesus had feet and God did not. And we look at that and go, well that's interesting. Or is it really insightful? Jesus came to put feet to God. He's God in a bod. And he's putting feet so that people would know their creator. That people would know what he's like. And Jesus is living his life. A life unlike any other life that's been lived to this point ever. And some people are beginning to take notice of that. It's why the Hebrew writer says this in Hebrews chapter one. I love this verse. In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets and at many times in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his what? His son. Whom he appointed heir over all things and through him made the universe. The son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. Jesus' relationship with the Heavenly Father was so radically different than what people were seeing around them. Do you realize that, that the Hebrew people had many different words that they would use and titles that they would use to describe God? Lord, God, God Almighty, Yahweh. But every one of these titles kind of has this mysteriousness to it, this, this distance. God is bigger and greater, and friends, he is. But when Jesus shows up on the scene and he goes through his prayer life and he begins to pray, do you know what word he uses? The Aramaic word Abba. Abba, Daddy. He's portraying this closeness of God, which was unheard of in that time. And he begins to show something different. That Jesus' contemporaries had plenty of names for God, but this Jesus began to portray, even in Mark 14, Abba. If it's possible, let this cup pass from me. But nevertheless, let your will be done, not mine. It's this closeness Jesus is trying to portray. And that's what we begin to see in this last story that he tells, Luke 15, verse 13. Not long after that, the younger son got together all that he had, put on his running shoes, took off for a distant country. He squandered his wealth and wild living. After he had spent everything there, there was a severe famine in the whole country. And he began to be in need. Everything crumbles unexpectedly. And suddenly, 
this plan of just running on his own begins to fall apart. And he's doing things and subjected himself to things that he never thought he would do. And suddenly he says, you know, I'm subcontracting out myself right now. Maybe I'll just go back to my dad. And I'm, I'm not worthy to be his son anymore, but I know my dad hires subcontractors, and maybe I can just be one of those. And so he makes up this plan and has this whole speech prepared, and he takes off for home. Verse 20. So he got up and he went to the father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with what? What's your Bible say? Filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. Friends, do you understand how radical this view of God would have been? A father full of resentment? Yeah. A father full of anger? Ticked off? You bet. A father full, full of hatred, yeah. Because that is what you see in the world. And Jesus tells a story of a father filled with compassion who runs to his son. See, a patriarch, the leader of his family, would never run. Aristotle said, men, great men never run in public. You would never run anywhere. You're the leader. You're the patriarch of the family. That would be humiliating to run. You have people walk to you. You don't run to them. And yet this father is filled with compassion, and he begins to run to the edge of the city. He's the first one to notice his son returning. And his son goes through the whole speech, okay, dad, I'm not worthy to, to be your son. I just want to be a subcontractor. And the dad just totally ignores him. And he just says, no, 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 bring the best robe. Put a ring on his finger. And he walks his son through the village back home. Why? You realize there's a Jewish custom in the, the early period here that, that said if, the, if a son rejected their father, and went and lived a wild kind of life, and they returned to this rejected father, that the elders of the city would take this son to the center of the village. They would take a pot, and they would break it at his feet, and it would be a legal binding banishment to this boy. You are not welcome here. And so this father humiliates himself and runs the gauntlet that he knows is waiting for his son, so that his son would know that he's still a son. He hasn't lost his identity. He may have chosen to run, but he has a father who runs to him. That is just profound, in incredible truth that Jesus is saying here. Can you imagine the feelings and the sense of what that son is experiencing as that party begins? But see, this is a story of two sons, isn't it? There's another son, verse 25 says, Meanwhile, back at the ranch, my interpretation, the older son was out in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him, What's going on? Your brother has come home, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he is home safe and sound. One son returns. And one son refuses. He's got his work boots on. And Diokoneso is in his heart. I, I can't believe what's going on here. This doesn't make sense. Jesus earlier, as he's living his life, tells the Pharisees another story in Luke chapter 10. That it's about how you love God and love God people, and in his actions and word choices, this son demonstrates that he does not love the father, and he does not love his brother. Jesus taught, out of the, out of the heart, out of the overflow of the heart, your, your mouth speaks. And this son goes into this refusal of, I refuse to come in. His resentment is in his heart. He's grumbling and muttering. He can't even bring himself to say, my brother. And when his dad finally comes out to him, he won't even say dad or father. He says, look, which in Greek is literally, look, you. There's this resentment in his heart. Dikoniso is taking root. 
it's important to note that the father comes out to both sons. What the older brother is saying to his father revealed this expectation of justice, not mercy. I expect that you be just because I've been working hard and I'm earning it and I want your justice. Really? Really. So I'm, I work in life. I always feel like I come up short. I don't think I'm alone in that. What the older son is saying is this is building a relationship built on reciprocity, that I do this, now you do that. I'm, I'm working, I'm earning, so that you owe me this. There's this relationship going on. This performance begins to mark his very life, and he is stuck laboring, working. Work, reward, work, reward. I worked for this, therefore you reward me with this. Let me give you a definition of spiritual laboring. It's continually seeking the love, blessing, and admiration of God through the perfecting of your performance for God. That it's continually seeking the love, blessing, and admiration of God through perfecting your performance for God. God isn't looking for you to do anything for him. That's the new paradigm. He makes a way. He's the father of compassion who runs and who now comes out and says, Technon, my child, pleading with him to come in. Take off the work boots and come in. Humble yourself. See, this relationship of reciprocity is an ugly foundation for any true loving relationship. If, if I do this, now you do this, and I live with this idea of you owe me, then I will live with anger and frustration as a part of my life. The great theologian, Brett Favre, said, you are only as good as your last pass. So what happens when your last pass is incomplete? What then? If, if you wear the work boots and you're trying to earn, and I do this, and therefore you owe me this, what happens when you fail? What happens is you begin to see life in a different way, and that might be a way of work reward to build a business, and that might be a way to run a government, but that makes a horrible way to run a religious system, an infrastructure. And Jesus is saying, there's a different way. Change your paradigm, change your mindset, choose a different way. There is a father of compassion that comes out to both sons to welcome them in if they choose to. Because the father wants the sons to want the father. They may get some of the things. And so often in our culture, I know a lot of Christians that just want God's things, his blessing, his love, his admiration, but they don't want the father. And Jesus is telling this story to prove that and to usher them in. There are three things that begin to chip away I believe, at this heart of compassion that we see in the Father in the story that I believe God wants to form into your heart, into mine. And one of those is if, if you keep score in life, you will constant, constantly live in this undercurrent of anger. If it's always about keeping score and, I, and this reciprocity, I do this, now you have to do this, then you will live frustrated with your spiritual journey with God. That as an elder brother, as you, as you adopt that mindset, if you try to justify yourself with right actions and to, to be obedient all the time and to be in a good person, then Jesus might be your coach and he might be your helper and he might be an inspiration to you, but he is not your savior. You're trying to do that all on your own. And you will live with anger and frustration. The call of Jesus in this story is there's the third way. I'm the elder brother who's come to search for you and to bring you home as found if you'll choose me. That's the gospel. But you have to choose. A, th a second way that begins to, to erode away this heart of compassion is if we uh, drift into letting our spiritual journey become all about duty, we miss the beauty of God. 
than if it's always about working and wearing the work boots and just slaving away. I've slaved for you, the elder son says. If it's always about work, then you miss the beauty of God. You don't get to experience what it is just to have the Father because you're always working for the Father's things and you miss out on those. Elder brother mindset might find God useful, but gospel-believing Christians find God beautiful and they enjoy him. There's so much written in the scriptures about the joy of the Lord is our strength that we can experience his joy. And friends, I desire for you to experience a relationship filled with God's joy, even in the difficult times. That a third way that begins to chip away at this compassionate heart of the Father being built within you is when you allow your performance and obedience, your work boots, your working to earn it, when you allow that to foster a sense of superiority. Thursday night, I'm in Payson. And uh, up there with my father-in-law fishing a little bit, kind of getting away working on sermon. And uh, we go to Chili's because you base playing. And we don't have cable. And so we go there. And we're watching the game. And it's a great game. It gets to halftime and there's this, this group that comes and sits in the booth behind me. Being really vulnerable. They begin uh, having conversations that were just crude. They began having conversations that were just, just laced with curse words and just hearing about life. And um, I found myself sitting there going, man, glad I'm not like that. And I found myself sitting there trying to watch a game. In my heart, I felt superior. And then about halfway through the second half, God just nailed me between the eyes and reminded me that I was lost. And then I was found. And the Father of compassion ran to me. Diokinizo was in my own heart. And I had to take time and say, God, you're right, you're right. Everyone around me in this restaurant is just as valuable as me. Everyone in this restaurant matters to you. I have a different occupation. So what? You love them. You love me. And the Father's heart of compassion is what you want to build into my heart. Forgive me. Because here's the truth, friends. You will have a propensity to put on one pair of shoes or the other. We will have a drift. And Jesus is telling a story to say, I want you to choose a different pair. I want you to choose humility. I want you to come home. Because he goes on to tell this other story in Luke 18 where he says, look, there's this Pharisee and this other person who's really broken in life, and they're both praying. And Jesus says in Luke 18, it's the humble that will be exalted, and those who lift themselves up will be humbled. And Jesus' call all throughout the scriptures is that I have come to show you a different way. I have come to show you what the Father is really like. Jesus ends the story with the bad boy being saved and the good boy being lost. Why? Don't you love the heart of Jesus that even in the midst of just a few weeks later, the very people that he's standing in front of, the very people he is telling the story to who are wearing work boots, he is pleading with them to come in, to come home, to choose humility and to humble themselves and to find that they too can experience God. I love this quote from Timothy Keller, probably my favorite quote in the whole book. I encourage you to read it if you haven't read The Prodigal God. He says, the key difference between a Pharisee and a believer in Jesus is inner heart motivation. Jesus spoke so much about the condition of our heart because that will drive our actions and our choices and our reactions. So Jesus is always concerned with the heart 
And see, wrong heart motivation will breed anger in life. It will rob you of beauty in a relationship with God. It will foster superiority. And wrong heart motivation can lead you to places of even trying to protect your spiritual reputation over fostering and growing and developing your relationship with the Father of compassion. That can happen to individuals, and that can happen to churches who are so busy trying to protect their spiritual reputation and yet missing the heart of the Father. And friends, church, we will be a church that reflects the heart of the Father, even if it means sacrificing some of our reputation. Because Jesus is telling a story about diakonizo, and he's calling people to say, choose the Father. Let his heart be built into you. Let his heart be a part of how you live. I thought I'd end today a little differently. Just give you a moment, some space, just some time to pray. Um, been a great series, and I hope that it's been nudging your heart and moving you. The reality is Jesus is painting a picture here of what God's really like, the mission that he's on, saying there's this paradigm where you can just run, you can quit, just take off and do your own thing. He's not saying that's a great thing because it leads to brokenness, lostness. There's this other paradigm that you can work and earn and try to, to be your own savior. And that still leads to lostness. And Jesus is saying there's a different way. Choose a new paradigm. So I don't know what has been nudged in your heart. Here's some questions for you just to simply consider. Jesus says to repent, to mend anew, to choose a different paradigm, to return to the Father's provision of grace and compassion for you and allow that to fuel you going forward. So what throughout this series has God begun nudging in your heart? Is there a theme that keeps coming up? Is there something that he begins to kind of drill down into your heart to begin to show you? What pair of shoes are you have a propensity to drift toward? Do you have a heart that longs for the Father as much as the Father's things? Are you missing him in the midst of that? How's your heart for the things that aren't lost. Father, I pray that just in the stillness of these moments, we'd be still before you. God, I believe that you want to stir the hearts of your people to reflect your heart of compassion. It's the most described emotion of Jesus. It's what we see on display so often. And yet, God, it's not what your church is known for. And it should be. So, Father, would you nudge our hearts? Would you continue to shape us and change us to be a people? that reflect the heart of the Father, that lean into the truth that there's a different paradigm. There's a way through the sacrifice and life and death and resurrection of your son, Jesus. That the way he lived and interacted with people would be the way that your church lives and interacts with people today. Father, each one of us here needs a nudge from you maybe a specific word from you. I know you gave me one this week. Continue to carve that out and to create in me a heart that reflects you. Father, we thank you for the grace and the freedom and the hope that your compassion brings to us. We want to lean into that more and more this week and in the weeks to come. 
We ask all of that in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me for just a closing blessing? Glad you're here today. May the compassion of Jesus Christ and God our Father be the one that guides you with wisdom and discernment and how to show that to the world around you, to the family that you share a home with, to the people in the cubicle next to you, to the friends that you'll call later today. His grace and peace be upon you. We'll see you next week. God bless.